What if you could turn back the clock? Fix something that's irreversibly broken. Imagine there's a solution that could help us reduce climate warming and fix our broken food production system. Change our direction. Wouldn't that be the miracle we've all been waiting for? Except it's not a miracle. It's pure nature. The answer can be found in our fields. We must rethink agriculture and the way we manage land. We can cut emissions and catch carbon from the atmosphere and store it back into the soil, thus turning the course of global warming around. The secret lies in the soil, diversity and microbes. One little spoonful of healthy soil contains more living organisms than there are people on Earth. These microbes help the soil to grow more food, adapt to extreme weather, hold nutrients and, yes, sequester carbon. We just need to invite them back. In regenerative carbon farming, soils are tended to and fields are cultivated into healthy, diverse, living environments. In Finland, we already have researchers and committed companies driving for change, as well as over 100 pilot carbon farms, where we test and improve carbon farming practices. We need sustainable, circular economy and even more regenerative repairing action. Regenerative agriculture helps nature repair itself and provides a solution we've all been waiting for. We have the answer. Now we need to act. Good morning to everybody, everybody online and here at the web webinar studio. Sunny, welcome from Helsinki. I'm so excited that we have over 200 online participants from many different countries and a group of top experts here at the webinar studio. My name is Laura Höyer and I work as the managing director at the Baltic Sea Action Group and I will be hosting the webinar today. Well, the topic of the webinar is of very high importance. So the topic is carbon markets meet carbon farming in practice, learning through carbon credit pilots. The webinar is part of EU Green Week and it is organized by many different projects, organis organizations and funders, as you maybe can see from all the logos down here. So Baltic Sea Action Group is one organizer and then the Finnish Catch the Carbon program that is funded by the Finnish Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. And then we have the Global 4 per Mille initiative and then the projects. A carbon farming scheme project that is funded by the LIFE program and then we have SDN Multa project that is funded by the Strategic uh, Research Council at the Academy of Finland. And then warm thank you to SEP Bank. So SEP Bank is providing these beautiful uh, studio webinar facilities to us as part of the Baltic Sea cooperation with our foundation. So warm thank you to all. To go on with the program. So today we will have five quite short, short presentations. As you can see from the program, we are going to first uh, frame the events and then we are going to have perspectives from Finland, from EU and from global level. And then we are going to hear about three, uh, three interesting case studies. The presentations are quite short, as you can see from the program. So we will have the discussion at the end. We have reserved one hour at the end for discussion. So please, those online, uh, send questions through the chat. You can find the chat box fr from, from the broadcast. And here in the audience, please keep your questions in mind and then pose all your questions during the discussion later on. And some more technical instructions for those online. So in the chat, when you post the question, the speakers here can see your questions here in the studio, but the other participants cannot see the questions. And it's not possible uh, to have discussion among the participants in the chat. 
but luckily we can have discussion through different social media channels like on the Twitter. So please be active on the social media and when you use Twitter, please use the hashtags we can see here. Uh, you can see here in the bottom, uh, here or up here, we can see carbon farming scheme and then hashtag EU Green Week. Especially when you use this carbon farming scheme hashtag, then it's easy for us to follow and then we can have a nice discussion also in the social media. But we go on with the program. We start with the presentations. First, we are going to have framing of the event. So contributions from the Finnish Carbon Action Work to the EU Carbon Farming Agenda. So please, Kai Kranholm, the project manager from the Baltic Sea Action Group. The stage is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen here in the studio and uh, over there online, also on my behalf. My name is Kai Graham from the Baltic Sea Action Group, as Laura just introduced myself. And it's, it's a great pleasure for me to frame this event about carbon farming and, and talk a little bit about how our work in Finland on the Carbon Action Platform contributes to the European discussion and development of, of the European um, carbon uh, market in the future and also policies related to that in, in agriculture. This presentation is, is largely inspired by, by the work in, in the uh, LIFE project that Laura mentioned. So I owe thanks to, to our partners, to the coordinator of the project, the Finnish energy company ST1 and, 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 and the partners, as well as the, the financiers, as well as the uh, numerous consultants we have, we have uh, had the pleasure to work with here. But let's uh, first look at the work in the Carbon Action Platform. Carbon Action Platform is now running since uh, five years ago. It's a broad collaboration platform bringing together uh, research from multiple disciplines, um, companies, and most of all, the most important part of it is our pilot farmers, which, which Laura also mentioned. The, the uh, purpose of the platform is to bring people together to learn about uh, sustainable agriculture and, and regenerative agriculture, as we like to talk talk in these days. Um, and and the, uh, the aim of aim of the platform is 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 to learn from from the farmers to connect farmers and, and research for for mutual mutual learning and and deliver lessons for for policy. And in order to scale all of this, of course, when, when thinking about the carbon markets and, and connection to, to climate policy and climate objectives, we need a scalable system to, to verify, monitor and verify the, the soil carbon stocks. And, and here, for this purpose, we have an extensive uh, work done by the Finnish Meteorological Institute uh, who have uh, set up this kind of a concept for for globally scalable uh, monitoring and, and uh, reporting and verification system. But the uh, the point point of all of all of this is, of course, how we move from bad soil to to good soil and clear waters, um, and how to do that, how to incentivize farmers to do that. Well, we we went and reached out to the farmers for for help and advice, and this is this is what what uh, my part in this life project was was focusing on uh, to to try to learn the, the farm context the, the context of of the farmers in in which they make their decisions and and how they are affected by 
by both the, the natural conditions as, as well as the uh, policy frameworks uh, affecting their work. Uh, the project overall uh, established uh, uh, this kind of idea of, of a value chain for, for, for the carbon market where, where the carbon credits are, are kind of a, 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 a commodity which, which is managed from, from uh, between supply and, and demand and, and uh, the, the project looked at all the, all the different aspects of, of this and then in the end uh, connecting with the farm context as well as the societal objectives established uh, the elements of, of governance how how we uh, how we see that the future european carbon market could could be operationalized but as i said uh, we went out to the farmers and uh, and and tested tested their their mm, preparedness and, and awareness uh, of, of uh, carbon farming and, and, and how, how they understand the, the measures, which we will talk about later on, but how they, how they also are affected by, by, the, by the surrounding conditions. And, and we did that in, in three different ways. We had um, modeling calculations performed by, by the Finnish Natural Resources Institute, on, on several farms, uh, we had a Europe-wide survey, and then we we reached out to selected farmers in in interviews and and uh, try to try to build more understanding about their their operating context, and and the findings from this work were uh, were threefold. For one, uh, we discovered the potential of organic soil improvers in, in storing carbon and, and this this led that then to to the pilot that Tanya will talk about later on but also that there is a great great demand for information knowledge and advice and and raising the general awareness of what we what we want to uh, move towards and what we are talking about and of course flexibility in in order to adapt to the conditions of, of the farmers uh the other the other side is of course the uh, demand for for carbon credits and, and carbon sequestration and the uh, demand side we we tested with in collaboration with the puro uh, marketplace and and soil food company and uh, and antonia will talk about this this later on but uh, but the uh, the trading pilot of of carbon credits based on this soil improvement fibers uh taught us that uh, the uh, expectations and and motives of of both farmers and and uh, the buyers of the credits are quite quite similar we we are all looking for multiple benefits and we are all looking for broader benefit to to the environment and, and climate and also to our business but then in terms of the price and and preparedness to to pay for for these benefits, there, there's a quite quite big gap between uh, the expected price or, or reward by the farmer and and, and the uh, preparedness to to pay by by the buyer. But uh, luckily, the the uh, expectations are are leading us to believe that the, that the, there is possible possibility for for win wins and and to have these two sides come closer together. Then of course we we are talking about the multiple benefit, benefits of, of carbon farming and, and we we wanted to verify if uh, if there is actually a base in in literature um, for for that uh, that the various carbon farming uh, measures that we talk about in agriculture reduced tillage cover crops organic fertilizers for example or regenerative grazing. Um, that they actually de deliver other benefits for the environment as well, and and the literature is quite unanimous that that they do, especially cover crops, uh, 
have uh, have shown to to contribute positively to biodiversity, water quality, and even nitrous oxide emissions. And this is verified by by uh, a range of uh, research around the world. All this, all these lessons, we are putting putting together, summarizing in a final report, which will be soon published on on the website of the of the project, along with several other reports. But to conclude the lessons for us and for this event from all this, I have I have three points. One is knowledge. We are we are moving in this green transition and this is largely about knowledge. So we need to build and embrace knowledge and know-how on all levels. On on farmer level but also in the in the uh, governance and authority level. And this also, also in, uh, requires that we have clear definitions when we talk about carbon farming and, and these measures and how to, how to apply them. Uh, then the other uh, lesson is that uh, we should aim for holistic sustainability. Single uh, steering by single objectives can, is of course effective from, from the uh, sector policy perspective. But then, when you translate that to the farm level, uh, there there might be might be conflicts, and, and and we should we should aim for that we we understand the the holistic concept context of of the farmer in order to increase the uptake of of the measures. So so um, integrating climate measures with uh, measures that help agriculture to to renew itself and and transition to to regenerative models. And then it is clear that farmers need economic incentives. So based on our, our experience, voluntary carbon market can really support and, and accelerate this transition, help farmers in, in the uptake. So this is uh, my message in short to, to kick off the event and uh, looking very much forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> It's so crazy. We also have a live audience, so we can have, have these uploads. Thank you, Kai, for the very clear presentation. And it's great to have such clear key messages at the end. Thank you so much. And so online, please remember, you can now post questions to the chat, even though I take the questions at the end. But please keep the questions coming so then we can have them at the end. So thank you. We go on with the program and then we go to the global perspective. Uh, do we have Paul Lu online? So we are going to hear from Paul Lu. He's the executive secretary. Great, great to see you, Paul. Executive secretary of the Four Per Mill Initiative. And he's going to tell us reflections from the global, global perspective. And Paul, today you're going to be in France. You are not with us here in Finland. But uh, maybe in, uh, actually, in about one year time, you will be in Finland. Hopefully, we are going to host a big conference in one year time here in in Finland. So at least then we will see face to face. Yes. I, I hope to be able to <laughs> to come, and I will definitely. It's on my agenda. But uh, yeah, it's true that this time I'm online again. We are we're used to be online for two years now, <laughs> but uh, being in presential is very important. That's true. But great, Paul, to have you online. And please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. I will uh, share my screen and uh, try to go with my presentation. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, I can see that you can see it. Okay. So, uh, just I would start to re recall a little bit about what is a 4 per mil initiative very, very shortly. This comes from a very basic calculation telling us that if we can store 0.4% of carbon in all the soil of the planet, then we could theoretically offset the uh, net fluxes of carbon released by in the atmosphere by the human activity. So that's really very basic calculation. So 0.4% is four per mil. And um, it gives us the, the, the hope that we can do something using the soil. And that's the main purpose of the name of this. So the goal of the initiative is to store carbon in the soil, to increase food security, to adapt agriculture to climate change already going on, and increase food security. 
so all of that posturing the sustainable development goals and you have the six of the goals that are uh, addressed by our initiative our initiative start to be uh, a small one uh, led by france it was launched in 2015 with 160 partners nowadays we have 721 partners who join us and among them roughly half uh, our members, that means they can contribute to the processing of the, the decision making. And uh, our chair is Stéphane Le Foll, previous Minister of Agriculture in France. And we have two vice chair, Gabriel Bastien from Canada and Ibrahim Mayaki from Niger. Here is a very quick overview of where are all our partners all around the world that uh, allow us to say that we are uh, an international initiative. Two years ago, we uh, work uh, on the validation of a strategic plan will give us uh, our vision, our mission for, for the future. And the vision of the 4 Million initiative is a worldwide healthy and carbon rich soil to combat climate change and, and hunger, which is quite a large vision, but it's a very important one. And uh, sorry, I would say that um, in, in this year, 2022, uh, soil health, which is uh, at the basis of all action should be one of the major subjects of the three main conventions that are meeting through the COP uh, this year. That means uh, the, the desertification uh, convention, the biodiversity convention and the climate change convention. And we are advocating for the, for the fact that uh, those big conventions take soil health and carbon sequestration at the basis of their action from this year. Coming back to the subject of our webinar, I just would like to, to start by something which is obvious for most of us, but uh, it's always good to say it again. So the, the, the compensation phenomenon is um, a compensation that can start at the level of the enterprise, that can start by reducing emission, which is very important, and reducing emission also at the level of the whole value chain of an enterprise. And the compensation at the end it's how we can remove CO2 from the atmosphere using projects, so like storing carbon in the soil, outside the value chain of the enterprise by financing projects. So this is very important, but enterprise should not only compensate outside, but should start by doing things inside the enterprise. So with uh, minimizing their own emission, working on all the value chain, and then they can go outside to make some for compensation. Another important part is the fact that uh, in the Paris Agreement discussed and validated in 2015 at the COP21 in Paris, uh, unfortunately, the Article 6 was not completely negotiated. Even though there was some uh, very good progress in that direction in Glasgow during the last COP of the UNFCCC, the Article 6 is really the article important to supervise the cooperation mechanism between all actors that could be the base for the voluntary market. So the, the Article 6 is divided in three approach. One is the cooperative approach, then you can discuss about the mitigation result in order to help each other for the NDCs, but they also a large part for the mitigation contribution approach, which is the mechanism allowing private and public actors to participate to the reduction effort of countries by financing project, that's what we are talking about. And finally, the non-market approach, which is collaboration to help each other to achieve the goals. And so if we look at the three main mechanisms, what we are talking about with compensation is really in that the center, what I put in, in red, so the mechanism for the contribution. And this part is not yet finished to be negotiated. So we are missing, in fact, some very important things which is the legal basis, the international legal basis that could allow us to go forward. So we need to be cautious. It doesn't mean that we cannot do anything, just need to be cautious not to uh, take some commitment that could not be uh, fulfilled in the future. And uh, at the level of the enterprise being uh, also reasonable on the price they can provide to the, to the farmers to compensate. Coming back to the global level, uh, there are three ways, in fact, to fight climate change, food insecurity, and uh, increase the biodiversity. Very quickly, one, the first thing is just 
try to preserve, conserve all the areas that are not untouched by the human activities and concerning what we call the hotspot on biodiversity, but also the hotspot on places where carbon content in the soil naturally is very high, like peatlands, like all the, the, um, the permafrost and, and some other place like that, very important. So please do not touch those areas, protect them. The second way is, is more difficult, which is the, the, the fact that some of the area already worked by the men uh, are not so uh, productive on the, the agricultural way, for instance, and, but they present a very high potential for uh, protecting biodiversity and for increasing uh, carbon in the soil. So if we could restore uh, those ecosystems, let them come back to the natural way, then we could uh, avoid a big part of the losses of biodiversity something like 60% of the expected extension, and we could sequester 300 gigaton of carbon in those places. But it's very difficult because, as you can see, you can see in the red in, on this map, these <clears throat> are also the places where agriculture is very well developed and very important for the, the people who are living on those lands. Finally, the third way to uh, go in that uh, direction is to increase the quantity of carbon in the soil that are under agriculture. And of course, uh, we can start by the, the, the most promising one, the one with the highest potential of sequestration. But of course, we can start that everywhere. And that's the direction that the Forper Mill would like to, to, to people to follow. So I will not uh, be long on this one because you all know why is it so important to store carbon in the soil. So to mitigate climate change, of course, to adapt to climate change. This is very important because the soil will be able to retain water more and also to be able to uh, be less sensitive to erosion. So on that sketch, I just try to explain that when you start agriculture on the land, you will go in the red part if you don't care. And if you adopt new management practices, then you could come back on the red, on the sorry, pink and then uh, green area, increasing the quantity of carbon in your soil. That's what we expect to do. To do that, um, if you look at what the society is calling us to do, is to use less mineral fertilizer and phytosanitary product in one hand while maintaining the biodiversity or increasing it and improving soil organic carbon. Of course, trying to have the same level of food production for the world people to be able to eat, that's food security aspect. But with the conventional agriculture, we are there on the bottom left of my sketch and uh, we would like to get inspiration in the nature get inspiration in the natural forestry ecosystem the most complex one and if we want to do that we need to use a vector which is called agroecology and by chance agroecology is composed of many many agriculture that are already existing but need to be just developed in some aspects like conservation agriculture organic or uh, regenerative agriculture and allow the farmers to follow their own way and choose what category of agriculture they would like to develop. If you take the example of conservation agriculture, then it's very simple, three main subjects. First of all, minimum disturbance of the soil, no tillage or minimum tillage, uh, direct sowing and, to, to and very light fertilizer placement. Then the permanent soil organic cover with uh, residue or with uh, cover crops. And finally, a, a very a large rotation of crops to allow not to have the same crops on the same place two years in a row. That's very important. It's an example of what could be done. But of course, there are so many other examples like agroforestry, regenerative agriculture and so on. But the step to scale up for some pilot uh, project uh, need to be followed and they, they, we need to work. When I said we, it means international organization, it means uh, governments, it means uh, farmers organizations, scientific institution, business, NGOs, need to follow a little bit all the, those steps, be sure that we sensibilize the farmers to what to do and the consumer detect the good practices to be developed, ensure the knowledge transfer, accompanying tra the transition, framing, the, the whole environment, this is business of the government, monitoring, reporting, verification, follow up what's going on, financing all this transition, which is important because the farmers will take risk 
and adapt the rule of carbon accounting because we need all of, of the actors need to share the benefits of this. And of course, we need to have an inclusive system of governance. If I would like to summarize all of what I said and bring some key message to, to our workshop today, I would say that, first of all, the compensation should be seen as the last possible mechanism a business could consider to reduce its impact on climate. This is very important, and all the, the approach developed by Net Zero Initiative is very, very uh, constructive in our sense. The second point is that we're still missing the complete international mechanism in order to ensure all aspects of the compensation. This will arrive soon, I hope, at the next COP in Sharm el Sheikh, but as you know, international organization and discussion may take long. Finally, the soil carbon sequestration is one of the most powerful tools uh, as it improves soil health with multiple benefits, and we need to privilege that nature-based solution as it is written in the IPCC report, the last one. And so we are at our small level, the 4 mil initiative. We are, will launch last Monday the virtual fair of the 4 mil on our collaborative platform during the EU Green Week. It will last, in fact, two months uh, for us, we will organize various uh, events, regional events, then thematic events. So please uh, go on our, on our website if you want to get more information and then uh, to participate. And uh, Baltic Sea Action Group is very, very active on the platform. And we use very often them as, as a demonstrative that we could do there. And finally, uh, as uh, Laura just said in introduction, um, we will uh, have next year in June the first Northern Europe for the Mill Regional Meeting, and definitely I will be there. So you, you have the link there if you want to get more information, but we are very proud to be able to associate to uh, Baltic Sea Action Group and the Finnish Ministry of Agriculture to develop uh, this, this project. And I hope that we will uh, see you there in person uh, in, in, in one year. Thank you very much, Laura. The floor is back to you. So much, Paul, for the very clear presentation and for the kind words for our foundation. Thank you. That was really nice. And I think it was very nicely you showed how important the multi-benefits are and then that we all need to take action. And I'm sure in the discussion we can continue about the different farming practices as we do have farmers, our, some of our speakers, and then in the audience. So I think that's one topic we for sure, can continue in the discussion. So thank you so much, Paul, and we will continue with you in the discussion path, so then we have time to discuss more together. But one thank you. Thank you, Laura. And then we go on with the programme, and now we continue with very concrete pilot examples. And first, we are going to hear about a trading pilot with carbon credits based on organic soil amendments. So we are going to have Tanja Sandalahti, uh, she is the head of carbon removals in Soil Food Company. Please, Tanja, you're welcome. Thank you, Laura, and hello to everyone online and here in the studio as well. Um, let's put the presentation on. So I will be presenting the first carbon removals from Finnish agriculture, and our experience from the last 10 months of being on the carbon market. So first, I want to share a few facts about our company. Um, Soil Food is a circular economy company. We've been established in 2015, and our mission is to replace virgin raw materials <coughs> with recycled materials as fast and in large volumes as possible. So we aim to make a sustainable food chain and to do this, we process side streams from different industrial partners. We have about 40 par uh, partners all in all here in Finland. And we process these into different soil improvement products and recycled fertilizers for agricultural use. We feel that when the sustain sustainable choice is also the profitable for all actors in the chain, then we can uh, w find a win-win situation. And so how are, are the carbon removals created in this, in this value chain? Uh, first of all, our carbon removals are created from one distinct product line. So the soil improvement products 
uh, fibers that are from pulp and paper industry side streams uh, are utilized for these uh, carbon removal creation. And these side streams would otherwise be disposed of by incineration. So the graph here shows a line that um, goes into the atmosphere and the C CO2 would otherwise be released at this point. Uh, the fiber application adds multiple tons of slowly decaying carbon into the soil, which we have then been able to calculate and verify uh, according to Pura Earth's standards and regulations and uh, put them on sale in the marketplace. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we have had our uh, carbon removals on sale for the last 10 months. So the first batch of carbon removals are from soil improvement products that were applied in 2020, and they were verified in, in the spring of 2021. Um, Pura Earth is a uh, internationally operating, but Finnish, originally Finnish company that uh, provides uh, carbon removals from different suppliers. But first about the benefits of soil improvement products. For farmers, carbon removals are not the only reason for, for uh, uh, applying carbon, uh, so, excuse me, fibers into the field. Uh, for farmers, they add multiple uh, nutrients and, and carbon into the soil. Uh, this results in better yield, better, uh, better soil fertility, and as well as it may lower the need of chemical fertilizers. Uh, in addition, research has shown that fiber application uh, uh, decreases the amount of nutrient leaching from farmlands, and studies have uh, shown that it may actually have the amount of phosphorus leaching uh, into waterways. So the benefits are many in, in, in uh, addition to carbon removals as well. So uh, the different criteria of carbon removals is, of course, an important factor. And uh, the permanence of the carbon storage uh, in our carbon removals have been uh, determined by the YASO model, a model that has been created by uh, the Finnish Meteorological Institute. It is used to uh, determine Finland's own national greenhouse gas inventory, as well as, as several other nations as well. Uh, the permanence of the carbon removal sold uh, as credits in, in our solution is uh, 20 years. So the, from the total carbon content, about 12 to 28 percent of the carbon is actually bound into the soil for the 20 years or more. This means, uh, in practice, that from the soil improvement fibers that are applied into the field, uh, about 50 to 130 kilos of carbon dioxide is um, uh, bound or removed from the atmosphere. And this means from four to seven tons of carbon removals uh, in, in the soil per hectare. So the, the carbon removals are a remarkable amount uh, in comparison to some other carbon farming practices. Uh, according to Puro's uh, economic acceleration impact, we, our solution has been um, to split the revenue of the carbon removal sales among the three actors needed to actually achieve the carbon removals. So we split the revenue uh, from the sales of the carbon removals among farmers, industry and soil food itself. So each of us are needed to create the, the um, carbon rules. We need to incentivize the industry to not dispose of the um, fibers in, in, in the, by incineration. And we need to incentivize the farmers to adopt these carbon farming practices and to apply fibers into the field. So the ten, last 10 months have, have been uh, an extremely uh, uh, educating time for us as a company. Uh, and the key takeaways that we have uh, learned during the way is that farmers are extremely interested in issuing their carbon removals for sale on the market. Uh, we, uh, last year, as the first time that these carbon removals were, were issued, uh, I the, the farmers were uh, perhaps a bit baffled. They were not yet 
familiar with the issue, but this year we could definitely see that the interest had arisen and farmers were uh, more familiar with the subject and they were also interested in being part of the solution. Uh, in addition, the need for common criteria uh, regarding the additionality, permanence, uh, verification and double accounting is needed. It is evident from the buyer's side that uh, the quality of carbon removals must be uh, must be set by common rules. And hopefully, as uh, was mentioned before in, in today, that you will have uh, a proposal for this legis legislation later on to this year. And last but not the least, the demand for carbon removals from agriculture um, is rising. So hopefully uh, we will see uh, a lot more actors uh, taking on the challenge to provide carbon removals from agriculture as the potential is is um, enormous. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. So much. Very clear presentation, and it was so nice to hear about very concrete action, but also very concrete needs you have from the researchers. So this is a good basis then to continue the discussion later on. Yes. Thank you so much, Tanya. And then we move on to our second case study. And now we are connecting again back to France. Is, uh, do we have Jonah there online? Yes, good morning. I'm here. Good, Good morning, morning Jonah. Everyone. I guess it's one hour earlier, so it's still morning there in France. Great to see you. So, Jonah Enman, you are the head of agro agronomic operations in Natais, and you're going to be telling us about Nature Le Monde, Popcorns Project's carbon payments. So, exactly. the floor is yours. Great to Thanks meet you, much. Jonah. I'll share my screen quickly. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation okay. So, um, good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, to the Baltic Sea Action Group for the for the invite for, to, for today's uh, webinar. So, as uh, Laura mentioned, so Nathais, we're a company based uh, in the uh, southwest of France, and uh, we've been working for a number of year of years uh, to work um, on a on a carbon footprint measurement system and um, a incentive, a financial incentive uh, for the farmers to um, sequestrate carbon. So to start, just to give a bit of context, uh, who we are. So Nathais, we're the European leader in uh, popcorn. We have 40% market share in, uh, in Europe. So we also uh, export to Finland. Um, we produce roughly 210 million uh, bags of uh, microwave popcorn. Uh, we harvest 57,000 tons of popcorn. We have a turnover of 65 million euros. So we have three main activities. We produce, uh, as I mentioned, microwave popcorn. We also supply uh, cinemas and um, companies that produce ready to eat uh, popcorn, so already popped popcorn. Uh, all over Europe, and we also recently started uh, Multigram, which stands for um, smaller bags of 500 grams, for example, that you would find uh, in the supermarket of unpopped, um, unpopped kernels. We export 90% um, of our production, and most of our production, so of the production of popcorn, is based um, was produced in the southwest of France around uh, around the factory and uh, we have a very close partnership with 250 farmers um, who we work uh, in uh, in a very strong link so the the company uh, was uh, started by my father and uh, we're, uh, we're a farming uh, family and so farming has always been um, well we, we always been very uh, strongly attached to um, to farming, and um, so the Naturellement Popcorn project. So we started this in 2019 with five partners. Um, so there's some um, agronomic research. There's one agronomic research partner, which is the INRAE. Uh, we also talk, uh, work with um, with Agrodoc, who is a 
a local uh, cooperative that advises uh, farming in, um, in conservation agriculture. And, um, and the last, well, when, uh, the, the, the SES Bio Partner. So they, these are French uh, research organism who is specialized in using satellite imagery for different applications. So our goal in this Naturellement Popcorn project, so uh, it's a, um, one of the aspects of that project, which I'm talking to you about today, is um, the, the farming side of, of that project. So our main goal is to increase the soil fertility through natural processes by increasing soil carbon storage. So how do we do that? Uh, it's um, mainly through um, reducing tillage and uh, the use of cover crops. So um, you'll see a bit later in the presentation, we believe that cover crops is a huge uh, opportunity for farmers to store carbon in the soil. Of course, we want to um, help. Well, to do that, the farmers need uh, um, to gain from it. So um, we we need to make sure that we enable um, uh, farmers to reduce the, the carbon footprint. And finally, we also want to um, meet consumers uh, and industry demand for sustainability. Uh, and um, we are in a good position because we have a direct link between um, between the farmer, so the producer of uh, the crop, and the uh, customers who um, who are more and more looking for uh, ways to improve their carbon footprint. And so the the carbon indicator, uh, carbon storage indicator, we think is a very powerful uh, tool because uh, a, st um, a soil that stores carbon is a, a healthier soil because we'll increase organic matter. Uh, a healthier soil will produce healthier plants, will improve water infiltration, will improve water storage. Um, and it's a great communication tool because it's something that's easy to understand uh, for the farmer, it's easy to understand, of course, for, for us as a, as a farm uh, food company. And it's um, a great communication tool, of course, for the, for the greater public. Um, and um, it's also for us as a, um, as a um, because we're looking to work with uh, farmers uh, all over the, the southwest of France. It's a great way to um, find new growers, and um, and uh, it's um, important for us, uh, from a communication point of level, to um, to make the farmers proud again. So I, I'm sure it's the same in many other countries. Uh, farmers are often accused of um, destroying the environment and uh, many other uh, pretty negative things. And uh, we want to change that, and uh, we want to make the farmers proud of what they're doing. And uh, if we can, if we can tell society and and uh, the local uh, the local people, so our farmers are storing carbon. Uh, it's a very powerful way to um, to make agriculture and our farmers uh, look. Um, uh, in a looked at in a positive uh, way. So today we already have 60% of our farmers that uh, use cover crops and therefore are storing carbon. So our project, uh, as I mentioned a bit initially, so we work with the farmers, we work with um, research organizations, and between the three of us, we're trying to um, uh, build um, something where um, which um, allows to measure carbon stored in the fields uh, uh, through the cover crops. So the goal is for the farmers to, to reward them for the environmental service they provide. Um, we're um, also working with a farmers association uh, to see how we can, what else we can do uh, 
to uh, store more carbon. So, you know, um, uh, implement uh, hedges and trees and, and things like that. Um, and uh, we're working with the research organization to develop that uh, monitoring, monitoring tool. And um, we're, we, as a Natais, as an agri-food company, it's a great way to uh, stand out from, from our competition. Buyers are becoming more and more sensitive to these issues. And also locally, um, we're, we, from a, we can was seen as um, from the farmers and also from the greater public uh, as um, as bringing something positive to the to the local uh, uh, to the local communities. So, uh, in a few words, our journey towards um, towards this. So, since 2012, we've been encouraging uh, our farmers to put in cover crops. Uh, by having a bonus for farmers that would put in these um, these cover crops in. So originally, uh, the reason why we wanted to um, put, put cover crops in was uh, we're in an area where there's a lot of soil erosion and um, and cover crops are a great way to reduce soil erosion. But obviously, um, it's also a... Um, uh, uh, it has a lot of other environmental benefits, and so this is why since uh, a lot, since 2012, we've been trying to help farmers via a bonus to switch uh, to implementing cover crops, and we've also put other in incentives for reduced tillage and things like that. But we wanted to um, find a way to encourage farmers to have very um, so to have um, more, um, how can I say, to have um, to improve their cover crops and not only put them in, but also have uh, very, um, very good levels of biomass because uh, increased biomass means increased carbon storage, which means soils are, are restoring themselves better and uh, all the other benefits I, I mentioned earlier. So. Uh, we launched this project on so that to uh, start uh, working on a, on a way to measure the biomass produced in the fields uh, through the cover crops. So currently we're um, finalizing the, the, the model that will, in, with, that will enable to measure the biomass through uh, satellite imagery. So satellite imagery has a great advantage is that it's uh it's repeatable it's easily scalable um and every three days through the, the sentinel um satellite network we get a, a value of the uh, of the biomass produced in the field with the spatial variability we are in in an area where there's um well i mean Every area in the world has some kind of variability within a field, but because we're on on slopes, there's uh, a lot of variability in a field, and we can capture that because the satellites have a resolution of uh, 10 meters by 10 meters. And so we co we convert the biomass produced uh, with these cover crops into a uh, long-term carbon storage in the field. And um, and so we're moving from a model where we pay if there was a cover crop to a model where we pay depending on how much uh, carbon has been stored um, in the cover crops in in the soil. So we're at the beginning of this journey, <laughs> but um, we we worked with a group of pilot farms for the past uh, three years to help with the the says bio so the research organism to uh, perfect their model and now for, for next year's um, contract to the farmers contract we're we're scaling out and uh, offering to all the farmers a bonus that will be paid on the actual uh, carbon they will have stored uh, in the field and so um, later on we'll we'll perfect the model 
uh, by adding other um, um, other parameters uh, to be even more accurate, uh, such as uh, uh, soil uh, data and um, uh, and other uh, things uh, that um, other data available to that will have an impact on the uh, carbon footprint of the farmer. So a uh, key message is every incentive, or we believe that every incentive to produce more biomass is a very powerful tool to increase carbon storage in soils. So um, we believe that uh, our approach is quite pragmatic and easy to understand. And I think that's quite important because there's a lot of um, in it initiatives uh, appearing and we need something if it's too complex the farmer won't go for it because uh, the, the the key element will be lost and so um, uh, yes incentive to produce biomass we believe is very important to increase the the carbon storage in soils it it has huge potential we uh, as it was mentioned earlier uh, by um, by Paul, the, the the soils are have a huge potential to 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 hold on to carbon, um, and that's why we put a lot of focus on that. When you look in greater detail, the other um, aspects um, like uh, a fertilizer or um, farming like machinery and diesel and things like that don't count for so much in the carbon footprint. Of course, these are things we need to work on, but for us, the priority is on uh, on implementing cover crops. As I mentioned, it's a win-win for all actors in the supply chain. And as I mentioned, we have the, the advantage of being, of being able to do the link between all the, the supply chain. And um, uh, another thing is, there's a lot of models appearing and generally uh, carbon footprint measurements are very complex because there's a huge amount of parameters that uh, are taken into account. And uh, as Laura mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we know what to do, but it's important now to start taking action. And that's what uh, we, we want to do through this project. And of course, it's not perfect. But it'll, they will, well, first, there will never be a perfect uh, modeling tool. And um, we believe that even if it's not perfect, we should still start so that we can, we can start acting. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll be able to answer any questions you have uh, at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Jonah, so much for the very clear presentation and very clear take-home messages also. And it was great how you brought the consumer interface to the discussion. So we will have the discussion after the final talk. So great to see Jonah, you at the discussion. And in the chat, thank you for those all online. We already have a lot of very good questions on the chat. So great to see you, Jonah, during the discussion, so then we can continue. Thank you Thank so you. much for the very, very clear presentation. Thank you. And somebody has been asking on the chat that is it possible to have the presentations? So yes, we are going, we are going to have the stream. Do you are going to see? We are going to put on the web page the stream of the events and all the presentations. So you will have all the material after after this webinar. So now we go on with the final uh, presentation of today. I think we are going to hear about the models. Jonah was talking about complex models, so maybe we can see some of those. So we will have Professor Marku Ollikainen, Professor Emeritus from the University of Helsinki. Marku is also the chair of the Finnish Climate Change Panel. So he's going to tell us about carbon compensation options and lessons from economic research. Please, Marco, the stage is yours. Okay, thank, thank you, Laura. And hello to everyone here and online. So actually, I will give you a few lessons from economic research concerning how carbon farming can uh, provide credits for climate policy purposes. 
And if you think we have already heard that the carbon farming has a high potential uh, to sequester carbon in soils. Current discussions in the EU reflect this thing because it has been discussed that carbon farming could contribute about 50 million tons to the becoming a new or renewed target for the sink, EU sinks that, that is, has been thought to be 310 million tons, meaning that it's one sixth of the, uh, of the plant, plant target. So that means that if we carbon farming becomes important, but of course it means also that being a part of climate uh, mitigation policy, carbon farming should fulfill the requirements of climate integrity, and also it should be economically feasible, as we already have heard. And if you think about climate integrity, it means that, that everything that we do uh, to create uh, carbon credits, they must be additional relative to a baseline, and also there should, should not be any leakage at the farm level or at the market level, or that should be taken into account. Of course, the requirement of permanence is crucial. It is generally thought that 100 years, everything that we have uh, sequestered should stay there. And as we have heard several times uh, already, measuring, reporting, and verification, this MRV is, is super important. We have explored these issues in a, uh, a manuscript, Carbon Farming, uh, Climate Integrity and Economic Feasibility. And here we are approaching uh, carbon farming and, and economics from a point of view of contracts, carbon contracts, and analyze how credit price, contract length, and the amount of credits that the farmer can produce impact the uh, economic feasibility. We have applied these notions then to a, uh, a number of case studies. I will highlight in three slides something that relates to uh, catch crops on mineral soils. But before that, when we started to do the work, the first question came out is that how can we deal with the uh, permanence in agriculture? It's well known that farmers are have no in incentives or, or are very unwilling to make very long contracts. 100 years perspective is impossibility when we are talking about uh, uh, agriculture. Therefore, we need a solution for that. We need a solution that is something relating to how we account for uh, credits from temporary projects. And we are focusing on economic solution or economic accounting on this, this issue. And the idea is to use offset ratios. Offset ratio determines how many emission units one sequestered unit from a temporary project can uh, 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 compensate. And the other thing that immediately came um, evident is that how can we ensure this MRV? We need scientific measurement we need scientific verification of the management practices that we take in agriculture. And promoting it requires many practical solutions. So, so experimenting, checking out, and things like that. Carbon Action is developing uh, a verification system uh, by using a field observatory, which is an open access online platform where all the experience that, that can be uh, obtained from the piloting carbon farms are reported and, and it provides a uh, place for um, analysis of this, this uh, experience. So solving these is crucial. And how, how did we do that? Uh, the case of catch crops. The first thing is, of course, then to analyze how this uh, practice can uh, uh, promote the uh, increase of carbon uh, in soils. Uh, we have measurement on that, so we can, we can think that, okay, when we are using year after year catch crops, we can maintain the amount that we have sequestered and we sequester more. But that takes place, uh, it increases, but in a decreasing fashion. 
So the black curve here indicates the concave uh, 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 sequestration. And we can take then over the contract length, which is uh, on the uh, vertical axis, horizontal axis, the uh, average, and then we have the average annual cumulative stock increase for the, uh, 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 to assess the uh, basis for the credits. But this is not enough if we have a uh, uh, temporary project. We have to think that, okay, what happens once the contract ends? And the farmer possibly shifts to a previous management practice or to another one. But for the, uh, let's say, the buyer or the society, one possibility is to think that, okay, the farmer comes back to the uh, original business as usual solution. Therefore, we have to um, assess that at which rate the uh, uh, carbon possibly is released back to the atmosphere. Sometimes it does not release at all, but this, is, this example is calculated for the case where it may come back. And then we have to assess whether, whether this, this um, release is faster or does it take at the same rate or is it slower? Because this impacts then how we treat this um, temporary, um, temporary uh, uh, sequestration and the, the uh, contract uh, that is temporary as well. And then we use the offset ratio. The offset ratio transforms the amount that we, we have kind of accumulated on average on soil during the contract period. And we multiply then this amount by the uh, offset ratio to get out the amount of uh, climate proof uh, credits. And the table here indicates something about this. If we have very short, uh, okay, there are, there are at least two approaches to define this offset ratio. One is discounting method. It's an economic uh, approach where we value the uh, temporary decrease of uh, uh, carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, 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 or then we have a ton year accounting, which does the same by using radiative uh, forcing. And using these approaches, we can define the offset ratios. And you can see that if we have only five years long contract, then the offset ratio is 0.137, very small. But if I increase the um, contract period, um, then the offset ratio increases. And here you can see that by just multiplying the average annual cumulative sequestration by the offset ratio gives us the amount of credits that we can sell to the market. And once this is done, then we have, we have the kind of the climate part of the uh, analysis done. And then we can look at the profitability or economic feasibility of, of carbon farming. And it's obvious that it should be profitable for a farmer to start this work. And, and here we, we can show that the profits from carbon farming depend on what is the soil carbon stock development, how long is the contract because it defines the offset ratio, um, and then of course the credit price. And the figure here indicates a baseline where the farmer does not have the catch crops uh, uh, the black curve there, and then the uh, colored curves indicate uh, how the profitability of carbon farming functions in terms of contract length, and then in terms of the uh, uh, carbon price. So the higher the carbon price, the more profitable carbon farming will be. If it's very low, then we need a long contract to make it profitable. So. In this sense, we can characterize the social conditions or the economic conditions for uh, promoting carbon farming. Uh, presentation is short, so meaning that there are lots of other aspects that I need to take into account, but here just uh, generalization from the whole paper. And the first and the most important thing is that, that what our analysis also on the other cases shows is that the carbon farming with farmers selling carbon credits from temporary product project is entirely doable. 
offset ratios are the factor that are crucial for maintaining climate integrity and the leakage issue can be uh, handled with. The challenge is, of course, that we should get accurate data, we could, should have clear accounting rules and verification systems. And then this also, given that the projects are temporary, it's not only how much we can sequester carbon in soils, but how well it will sustain there. So accumulation and depletion are both important issues, as we already heard from Tanya's presentation as well. And this is the point where the uh, Carbon Action is, is Initiative is doing much work. And based on this, our recommendation is that if we are going to have credit markets as a solution, we could start with simple and proven management practices, because that put pushes the, the market started. And then we can increase the practices as long as we get information and understanding, and farmers get that as well. And, and, and then there has been discussion here about accounting, accounting rules, how we should into, take into account co-benefits and co-damages like Kai's presentation. And, and it's obvious that that, that that can be done. But it's interesting to ask that could we also include in, in carbon markets the aspects of uh, impacts on runjet loading and biodiversity. If you are thinking the general voluntary carbon markets, we often have carbon credits plus, plus women's rights, plus uh, children's schooling. So market has been full, not within this context, but in other more general uh, contexts that we have, we have the carbon and some additional aspects. And whether we should develop it into this way is, is a question uh, that should be discussed uh, more, more kind of um, concretely, but it might be an interesting option for us. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Marco. And, and it was great that uh, it was great that you brought into discussion the accounting for co-benefits or co-damage, mm. uh, emphasizing biodiversity and nutrient leakage. But I think we can continue that yep. discussion soon as we are soon going to start the discussion part. So thank right. you so yeah, much, Marco. Thanks. So now we are moving to the discussion part. And here at the webinar studio, we are going to have a little bit, little technical break. We are going to get ourselves organized in other part of the studio. So we are just going to have a few minutes break. So see you in about two minutes. We continue discussion. Thank you so much. What if you could turn back the clock? Fix something that's irreversibly broken. Imagine there's a solution that could help us reduce climate warming and fix our broken food production system, change our direction. Wouldn't that be the miracle we've all been waiting for? Except it's not a miracle. It's pure nature. The answer can be found in our fields. We must rethink agriculture and the way we manage land. We can cut emissions and catch carbon from the atmosphere and store it back into the soil, thus turning the course of global warming around. The secret lies in the soil, diversity and microbes. One little spoonful of healthy soil contains more living organisms than there are people on Earth. These microbes help the soil to grow more food, adapt to extreme weather, hold nutrients and yes, sequester carbon. We just need to invite them back. In regenerative carbon farming, soils are tended to and fields are cultivated into healthy, diverse, living environments. In Finland, we already have researchers and committed companies driving for change, as well as over 100 pilot carbon farms, where we test and improve carbon farming practices. We need sustainable circular economy and even more regenerative repairing action. Regenerative agriculture helps nature repair itself and provides a solution we've all been waiting for. We have the answer. Now we need to act. Okay. Thank you. So welcome back to the stream. 
online audience and audience here at the webinar studio. So we have heard five very interesting presentations and now we have time for discussion. Uh, do we have our French connection there, our French gentleman on, online there, Jonah and Paul? Yes, I'm online. Okay, great. Sweet Perfect. Technology is working perfect today. Great. Thank you so much. So welcome back, Paul and Jonah and Marco, Kai and Tanya. Uh, and thank you so much for the online audience. We really have received a lot of very good and interesting questions. And we will start the discussion by taking these questions from the online audience. So I just put my glasses on so I can see the questions. So we start. I think, Paul, we start from you. It seems so. So who can so join and sign the initiative and how? Is there a network for per for, for per mille initiative? Yes. Good question. Very simple, very simple question, very simple answer. <laughs> uh, you can find all information on our website, www.4p1000 in, in figure.org. And there is a special uh, place for joining. So who can join? Um, only country, organization or business, not individual, unfortunately. And it's very simple. You have only two documents to fill an uh, uh, Excel sheet with your information for us to, together and um, a document when the, the new organization who want or the new country who want to join can share our objective and, uh, and also, of course, uh, all, all our um, governance. So very simple, but if you uh, if people want to cannot find the, the, the proper thing, they can join me on the, on the the mail secretariat at 4p1000.org. Thank you, Paul. So it does seem that you made a really good impression as everybody wants to now join for per mille. And we have <laughs> so much enjoyed the Baltics Action Group to be part of your network and the collaboration. Thank you so much. You, and then it seems, Tanya, that you have really a jackpot. <laughs> there are a lot of questions for your presentation, so be prepared. All right. Fibers as organic fertilizers may fix nitrogen and emit plant growth. What about yield effects? Uh, well, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, uh, the benefits for farmers are multiple. So the benefits uh, fibers have in, in yield is it, it, it may increase the yield, it may increase the fertility of the soil, and in addition, it, it will lower the need for fertil uh, chemical fertilizers. Thank you. Very clear answer. Uh, so why permanence 20 years wills reduction on the crop, cropland is a 12 to 28 percent after 20 years? Um, it was actually um, in the presentation I mentioned that from the total carbon content from one fiber application, the uh, slowly decaying carbon is uh, from 12 to 28 percent. This uh, variation is due to the fact that soil improvement pro products is one product line. So inside we have many, many different products that have different um, different uh, percentages of carbon content. So um, from one application, the slowly decaying carbon is the 12 to 28 percent um, percentage uh, factor. Okay, thank you. Very clear answer. And then we continue. Is the pulp waste used in carbon credits used in the industry? For example, do they incinerate the pulp for energy in the production of their products? Do you ensure that there isn't equivalent of carbon emitted in the replacement of pulp in industry? Uh, well, as I mentioned that uh, the pulp and paper industry dispose of these side streams. So for them, they are not used as, uh, they are incinerated, but not for the energy use. So actually these side streams are, contain about 70% water. And so to be able to incinerate the side streams, they must add um, an, another alternative fuel to actually be able to incinerate them. So the energy loss is not um, uh, significant for, for the industry. Okay, thank you. Again, very clear answer. Okay, so what is the relevant time frame to be able to prove the soil carbon accumulation on soil? So basically, how long from the baseline formulation the farmer can have carbon credit 
for sale by your experience. And I think it's Tani for your <laughs> again. <laughs> yes. um, well, we verify the carbon removals uh, after the delivery and application of our fibers. So as I mentioned, on sale we have now the carbon removals from uh, the 2020 applied fibers. So uh, they were verified in 2021, meaning that after the year, we uh, can count all the deliveries that we have made uh, to uh, distinct farmers around Finland and, and then verify the carbon removals from them. Uh, normally, uh, fibers are applied to the same field in, in once every five years, so it's not uh, an annual um, application. Uh, of of, of um, fibers, uh, but in that sense, uh, it is always the year after that we can verify um, the, that batch of, of fibers. Thank you, Tanya. There are still two two questions. So uh, this is now in Finnish. So, but I translated. Uh, so, what? How did you determine the soil carbon store? The changes in the soil carbon and the carbon sort of uh, offset. So what is the carbon reference? Uh, yes, uh, the YASO model, which is uh, uh, created and, and developed by the Finnish Meteorological Institute, uh, uh, estimates the amount of decay, the uh, carbon decomposition um, percentage in, in the soil. And so the carbon removals have been uh, developed in, in, um, in line with this model. Okay, thank you. Again, very, very clear answer. So then... Um, Soil improvement fibers from pulp and paper industry. What is the full volume potential of this waste stream to be turned into soil improvements? How much waste there is per one ton of produced pulp? pulp. I would suppose that uh, this is um, something that the pulp and paper industry does not want to uh, reveal or share this information with with us. But uh, about ninety percent of side streams of from the but pulp and paper industry are still incinerated to this day in Finland. So um, we have a, a potential amount of side streams to utilize for recycling at the moment. And, and so um, a shortage in that uh, supply will not surely take place soon. Thank you so much, Tania. And it was such an interesting case study, as we can see from so many questions. But you had such clear answers to all of those questions. Now we, we move off, uh, on to Jonah. There is a question. So how do you introduce cover crops in the maize cropping system in the maize roll chasen in an economic, e economically viable way? Uh, is it muted, Jonah? If you put the microphone sorry, on, please. Sorry. Thank you so much. So um, in our area, most of the farmers will have a, a two-year rotation where they will alternate uh, corn and wheat. So we have a big period between the wheat harvest, which is uh, which happens the end of June, beginning of July, until the next spring, the following spring, where we have a, a potential to grow cover crops. So um, we on our farm and some of our growers even do two cover crops. So we have um, we've been doing for a few years. Uh, right after the harvesting of the wheat we'll put in a, a cover crop that is more suitable for the summer, um, which, uh, depending on rainfall, can produce very high levels of, of biomass. Um, we went up to 10 tons of 10 metric tons of uh, biomass uh, per hectare in two months, which is significant. And then we'll put in a second cover crop, uh, which we'll implement in September. So usually we we it's mainly based on on faba beans uh which is a species that works well in our in our conditions and which also obviously has the advantage that it's a legume which will store which will be able to fix uh, nitrogen from the from the atmosphere uh, into the soil which then helps uh the following crop following crops even because has an impact on the on the corn that will uh, that will be planted right after, but also on the on the wheat on the following wheat that will happen uh, nearly one year later, um, and then we have some growers that uh, have longer rotations where there's always an opportunity. Uh, generally, before before corn, there's always an opportunity to put in a cover crop, um, and uh, so it doesn't really have an impact. Uh, 
on the on the what we call the cash crops. It's just something we add in between two crops where before the farmer uh, would have just left a bare soil. Thank you so much, Jonah. And few more questions, very specific question about the satellites. So what satellites are used with this high resolution? Is it Copernicus or Sentinel satellite? So it's it's the Sentinel satellite, uh, which has the advantage that uh, while well, the imagery is uh, uh, free access and also um, the the recurrence because it, it will fly over um, the whole globe mm. every three days um, so that means every three days uh, we can have a measurement uh, which is very important in our model because um, we want to be as close uh, as possible well we want to have a measurement that's very close to the date of destruction of the cover crops and um, the Sentinel-based satellites are, are very good for that. That doesn't mean that in the future maybe we'll be able to implement other satellites in the in the model to have an even more regular and accurate mm. uh, estimation of the biomass that is produced. Thank you so much. And then the other panelists, if you want to continue or add to the comments, please feel free. But then uh, one very interesting question, Jonah, about the economics. So. It was said that your approach is excellent from the online comment, but how to scale it up to cover all of the EU? And if farmers benefit from using these cover crops anyhow, uh, so will we, the public, be overpaying? For example, in Finland, reduced tillits proved to be economically attractive even without the subsidy due to the reduced cost. Yes, I mean, um, it's... Uh... A good question, but um, what's important to uh, note is that the use of cover crop is generally very positive for the farmer, but not so much short term. And uh, short term, it's for many farmers uh, more of a risk uh, to implement cover crops, and uh, it's a cost because you have to buy the seed uh, for, the, for the cover crops. And um, so it's important in the first stage uh, to, um, to help the farmers through financial incentives, but also with uh, training and also, uh, which we have also in our company, agronomists that, are, uh, that know the subject, that have experience and that can help the farmers uh, make the right decisions in, uh, in implementing the cover crops. and. Also, the big challenge is uh, to, in our case, to uh, have a, also a good crop of, uh, of corn, because if, uh, it, if, uh, if it has an impact on the, on the cash crop, then generally it's not, uh, as a whole, it's not beneficial for the farmer. And um, I mean, we think that it, there has to be a financial incentive mm -hmm to to um, make the farmer uh, realize that uh, well to help him mm. have a very intensive uh, cover crop mm. which has a direct impact on the on the carbon that's that's stored and um, so that the farmer treats his cover crop mm. nearly like a like a cash crop uh, the financial incentives are are important thank you Thank you. Does somebody want to comment the need for subsidies? Yeah, this this <laughs> relates very much to how the common agricultural policy is also designed. There is some overlap with with the incentives that it provides and some some uh, let's say discontinuity when it comes to this uh, carbon sequestration target. So, so I think that we need some revision of the uh, common agricultural policy to to accommodate better the shift to, to towards carbon farming and 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 perhaps also shift uh, this we need to discuss about uh, an issue that is called double dipping meaning that if we have subsidy from the, the the common agriculture policy and we have a possibility of selling credits to the market mm. so there are two sources of revenue and 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 the 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 cap policy should 
should should be accommodated to this as well. Mm. So I think that we have we we have a need to make reform. reform. Uh, of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh -huh. I think Paul, <laughs> if you can close the yeah. microphone still, uh, yes. please. Yeah, yeah, we need to reform cap policy to better accommodate this carbon farming. Uh, uh, EU made a uh, notification or or what is it called uh, communication on sustainable carbon cycles and gave very high emphasis on carbon farming there. And, and and but but there are no hmm. no uh, still no steps to revise policy hmm. accordingly. I think that there are lots 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 to do when we redefine the old incentives. Thank you. And then Paul, you had a comment also, please. Yes, I completely agree with what was said. Um, well, for us, there is something very important is that the farmer need, first of all, to leave from their production. I mean, the, f the price paid for their production need to be fair and include the cost of production plus the living of the farmers. That's the first element which is not negotiable. Then, on the top of that, if the farmer is doing through his practice or her practices um, some uh, good action for the society, like storing carbon in the soil, then they should be pay for that. And uh, as the professor just said, they could be paid or on the public money with, the, for instance, in Europe, the common agricultural policy money subsidy or on the carbon market compensation. And this need to be very clear. I would personally prefer that the farmers being uh, paid partly by the, the, the public money for that service because it's a service rendered to the whole society mm -hmm. then but it's very clear on a small amount to be honest with them within the cap and with the other one we want to go further they can receive some money from the compensation scheme from the private uh, company mm -hmm. and then they could be higher but it's all on the top of the price paid to the farmers and not included in the price as some of the actor want to uh, proposed to the farmers. This is not fair and we need to be clear on that question. Thank you so much, Paul. And Kai, you had okay. a comment. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to comment on the, on the threshold between the <laughs> public subsidy and the market. That's maybe more Marcus territory. But uh, I think the essence is uh, in, in regarding the question of whether we are facing the risk of overpaying with some measure. I think Jonah pointed our attention to the, to the essence that, that uh, instead of worrying about this overpaying, we should uh, ensure that we set the incentives in, in the way that uh, it supports this long-term transition in, in agriculture and in, in farming practices that, and, and where, where the farmer uh, applies these different measures in a conscious way with, with some kind of clear objectives to improve soil health or productivity or, or increase the, uh, the green cover year round. So that uh, so that these measures are are part of a logical systemic uh, shift in, in in farming methods, and this way this way uh, we support this this uh, agricultural transition and also climate policy in in a way which which uh, benefits the society overall. That's that's true. Thank you, Kai. And then uh, Jonah, there is a question about the permanence of of the carbon storage over time. How do you do you follow that? How do you tackle with this permanence issue? So um, we well, what how we've worked out our model is, um, uh, or at least that's the first step of how we've uh, of our of our journey, if I can say so. So we're currently we're measuring the biomass. And then we've used uh, literacy, so different studies that have been made uh, around the world to convert that into CO2 that's um, permanently stored into the soil. And um, that's where we are now. And uh, that's what I was explaining uh, a bit earlier. The next steps would then be to add in uh, some other um, parameters to uh, um, to take into account uh, some other aspects. And uh, we all know that uh, soil tillage and uh, also the temperatures, the weather and the 
and and uh, the temp yeah the temperatures will increase mineralization, which means um, the there'll be the carbon could be destocked. But uh, at the minute we're focusing on on just improving uh, versus uh, previous practices by increasing the biomass produced, and that we 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 convert that into um, into uh, long-term stored carbon based on what we what has been shown by previous uh, studies. Thank you. Does somebody want to comment on the permanence issue? Uh, Paul, please. Thank you. But if, if there is another <laughs> comment, of course, I don't want to monopolize the, the, the steps, the, the no four, sorry. But I, I was just, just on that subject. It, it's true that most of the people that come on the market of the, of the carbon just start um, thinking about what could be the permanence, how we can check that and so. But it's very funny that they never ask that question when the carbon sequestration is proposed by a forest project. And the forest project is about the same problem. If, if you set a fire to a forest, the forest will disappear in a in few hours and all the carbon store will not be stored anymore. So the, the permanence is some, it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that only in human brain, I mean, it's just nothing is permanent. It's just a question of temporary. It depends the, the length of this temporary status. But I think we need to work and advocate for the fact that storing carbon in the soil is about the same kind of permanence as storing carbon in the forest. The only thing is that we need to stress is that the farmers need when he applies some practices, he need to stick to those practices for a long time. That's it. We know that if we plow a, a, a land where um, carbon was stored for 10, 10 years or five years, then we can release all the carbon at once. But that's exactly the same that if you scratch a, a, a matches somewhere in the forest and just burn it. So this question of permanence is important to be considered. The additionality is also a question very important, but no more than in other uh, categories of uh, storing carbon using the, the nature. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I, I, yes. I would like to add to this that yes, equally important, but that means that we should not neglect it. Mm. Our experience from the uh, California emissions trading scheme, where they allow this voluntary project from uh, forests shows that the carbon leakage that comes out either from the released or failed projects and from the uh, leakage through market is more than 70 percent so we cannot build mm. climate policy on on um, on on an approach where we neglect this aspect it's a different thing than to promote good farming mm. methods mm. but climate policy must be rooted on permanence or the way how we handle it there is no 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 exception to this a clear comment actually also also in the chat there is a comment that avoiding leakages is crucial so as marco said uh, there are so many questions online but i think now we will uh we can continue this later, but now I would like to activate our audience here in our webinar studio. So, please, the audience, do you have any questions? And you can come up here to post the question. So, can you, yes, please. Yes, 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 thank you. Uh, if you can come here, so you can be part of the stream, so you can, we have more. <laughs> uh, is that, uh, that is perfect spot, isn't it? Okay. Looking at the, yes, thank you yes, so much. Hello. Well, I don't know where to look there. Yes, and yeah, present yourself and yes, please ask. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Niklas Kaskel. I'm the Chief Impact Officer at Compensate. Compensate is an organization that works on the voluntary carbon market. Um, I have a general, I would have so many questions and comments, <laughs> but I'll make it quite general because I hope that will then lead to further discussion. Uh, when the value chain of the carbon credit was uh, described in the very early, uh, in the first presentation, I think something was missing. The value chain doesn't end when a credit is retired. It ends when a, the buyer makes a claim. And this is really crucial. Um, and this relates to the integrity, the climate integrity of that credit. That integrity should be reflected in the claim that the buyer makes. If they make an offset claim, 
a climate action claim, a contribution claim if it's double counted under the Paris Agreement ru rules or so. So I think that's really, really crucial when we speak about carbon markets is why are buyers buying these credits? Mm. If they are buying them to achieve net zero, I don't think these credits are doing the, the job. They, I mean, they're not good for a net zero claim. Car carbon neutrality, perhaps if we apply the offset ratio that Marco has here suggested that we do. So I think we need to always keep in mind why the buyers are buying these mm -hmm. credits. It's really crucial to incentivize uh, soil farming or, or like carbon farming and, and all, all of that. But the carbon markets, if they're used as a tool to incentivize this, we need to keep in mind why buyers are buying these carbon credits and make sure that the claims they make are truthful. Thank you. Thank you. Very clear question. And yeah. maybe I so who wants to tackle first? Well, maybe, maybe I just I'd come because because I was referring to to what I yes. presented. I I agree absolutely. And and this is this is the part of the climate policy and and uh, issue where where we should be really really considered of of the uh, permanence and 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 priority of emission reductions and and secondarity of of these these offsets and, and compensations. So, yes, from from climate policy perspective, absolutely agree. Do you um, want to Paul or Mark want Marco to comment on this? John. Yeah, I agree. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. What about <laughs> uh, Joan? Actually, I could continue because there was a question about how the consumers are they willing? Uh, do they want to promote these issues? The buyers there, buyers of popcorn. Yes. So. Um... Obviously, it depends, <laughs> but it's becoming more and more of a topic. So um, obviously, um, every country has more or less uh, um, sensitivity to that subject. To that subject, but we we can see that um, that uh, the buyers are more and more concerned about this, and um, they want to. Uh, yeah, they want to find ways to have a more sustainable product and to be able to communi communicate about it. So one one thing I didn't mention, but what we're looking into and uh, is um, how can our customers um, make sure that they have a, a, a fair tool and um, how can I say that, a, how they can make sure that they can communicate that in a way uh, where the consumer doesn't see that as a as another label. I mean, there's so many labels now uh, available on the market, which uh, the, I mean, the consumer is lost in front of all these labels. Mm. Um, and so we're we're looking into seeing how we can, um, for example, use uh, blockchain technology to make that direct link from pretty much the field and the farmer to the to the package of popcorn so how we could imagine that is that the um because everything will be pretty much automized uh, we could imagine that the consumer will scan his package and uh, he will see all the details uh, about his product and he would be even able to see so um, this uh, this uh, package has been made with corn that came from this field, mm. which has stored that amount of carbon. Okay. And so that's, again, how we're trying to make the link between the farmer and the consumer using technology. So we're still a long way yes. from that, but we believe that um, this can help uh, the consumer actually believe in what he's buying, being able okay. to have that direct link through, uh, through a technology like blockchain. Thank you so much, Jonas. Now we would have so much to discuss, but not so much time anymore. So I, I ask you to keep the answers quite short and concise, Sorry. so we have more time for questions. Paul, please. Yes, I just want to add something on the, on the last point, the, the relation with the consumer, because the consumer needs to be informed of what is he's purchasing. Um, <clears throat> we had a, a discussion yesterday during the the World Living Soil Forum in, in, in Arles, uh, about one of the propositions made by uh, the Technical Institute of um, Organic Agriculture in France, just to build up something which is called Planet Score. 
it's a kind of inclusive label who give a, a note between A to E uh, to product, including all aspects of the product. Uh, if it's a vegetable product, where it come from, how it was cultivated, how much carbon it can store, and so on. If it's an animal product, where how how the animal were bred, how they were fed, which what kind of product they were fed. If it's coming from Brazil or if it's coming from uh, from uh, local production for cereals. So this is very interesting, and uh, we will maybe develop uh, um, um, a discussion and another webinar on that subject. Mm -hmm. But I would. Mm -hmm. I um, advise you to have a look to that. It's called Planet Score. Great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. And then we continue with the questions from, from the webinar audience. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, my name is Mariana Suorsa, and I come from the Minis uh, Ministry of Agriculture or Forestry of Finland. Uh, this is m more maybe a comment, but Laura mentioned the catch the carbon in the opening words. So a few words about that. So um, we are running a catch the carbon climate package, which is part of the Finnish governmental program. And currently we have more than 100 research, development and innovation projects of, uh, in the package. And when we had the last application round, we allocated quite significant amount of money to study and develop carbon markets in Finland. So the science and research are really important to like assess the economic base for the markets, both in, when it comes to national economy and to a single farmer and a farm. And also our projects are developing the common rules for the carbon market, which is really important to ensure the reliability and transparency of the carbon markets. And uh, we have already discussed about natural sciences and kind of agricultural sciences and economics, but also I would like to remind that this really needs some multidisciplinary research. So in our Catch the Carbon projects, we also have behavioral, behavioral scientists, psychologists who are studying what, uh, what makes a farmer to be a carbon farmer. It's not only about economics, but it's also something that we can affect with our behavior or the farmer's behavior. So multidisciplinary research is needed and that is what we are supporting thank you thank so you. much thank you it was really really good comments and and thank you for it's great that we have a big emphasis in the government government program in finland on the catch the carbon theme and that we can now continue so now some projects end some are continuing we have new projects starting and i can tell now the online audience that he, we here at the webinar studio we continue with lunch that we can continue discussion here with the new projects so we also the politics action group wants to we typically work as a matchmaker and bringing different uh, organizations and projects together so one uh, sort of aim for for today's webinar is also to bring all the projects together and continue the discussion because we do need so many different uh, multi-disciplines, different projects to come together to tackle the problems. And is there any more? No, no comments here, but are there any more uh, questions from the audience, please? Hello, Kirsi Tiusanen from ST1. Uh, I have two questions actually. Uh, for Jonah, uh, I would like to ask that are you still the sole uh, incentivizer for the carbon credits that you produce in your projects? And are you planning to uh, send them out there to carbon market? Or are you already doing that? And then I have also another question for Marku mm -hmm. that have you tried to put into the economic, economic models those co-benefits that you asked. Thank so you. Those very, are my questions. Thank you. Thanks. Very clear questions. And then Jonah, please. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a good question, which we <laughs> ask ourselves regularly. So uh, at the minute, um, we haven't really got um, any kind of uh, carbon initiative where we feel like we could fit in. Uh, for different reasons. Uh, some are because we were not looking at a global farmers approach because we only have one crop on, on at the farmers. Uh, 
also we there's some local initiatives also well national french initiatives uh, which are appearing there we have a problem because they're not recognized uh, on the export market uh, so that's another topic uh, well we're not going to get into that now but that's also a problem um, because there's a lot of initiatives happening elsewhere is um, how do we for, for companies like us uh, for supply chains that are quite um, diverse and I mean uh, geographically how how do we solve that uh, problem so at the minute what we're looking into is um, uh, first the first step is to neutralize the carbon emissions uh, from our factory uh, through the through the carbon stored uh, at our farmers that we pay obviously um, so we started this year doing a, a carbon footprint analysis of the factory so again i'm not going to get into the details but it's also a um, uh, interesting topic because what we see is that the, the these um, models are based on a lot of averages and theoretical um, theoretical emissions per type of products and um, I mean there's a huge amount of work still to be done to have reliable and accurate um, uh, measurements of uh, carbon emissions and storages uh, and to conclude we might one day when we find a model that works for us um, get into a um, uh, official credit uh, carbon credit market but we're not there yet okay thank you Jonah. and then marco you remember the question yeah, yes <laughs> i do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay yes we have tried uh to include these uh water quality benefits in there uh from the from the uh, uh profitability uh angle for the farmer and it's obvious that if somebody base pays for that also it increases the profitability for carbon farming, including this um, uh, soil uh, biodiversity or underground biodiversity uh, is 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 more challenging. Uh, we are trying to currently to determine the uh, let's say the operative value of 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 microbial biodiversity uh, through the uh, improved soil productivity. And once we get this done, then we can try to assess what sort of uh, uh, value added that would provide also to carbon credits. But, but this we haven't done. But it's obvious. In both cases, they increase the profitability of carbon farming. And if there is a, a buyer who is willing to pay for all benefits, of course, then the uh, price of carbon credits would increase and it would be more beneficial. Yes. Thank you. That was a really good question. I'm happy to collaborate in this SDN Multa project mm, that is still continuing it, yeah. three years and yeah. hopefully, but maybe we have to apply for some more funding, uh, more, as always. More, more than likely. <laughs> to admit it yeah. to funders, it would be a very important topic to continue. Also, I think EU-wide and globally, a very, very, very crucial topic to combine these climate biodiversity issues, especially, but not easy. Not easy. Not easy. But we will get there. Okay, more questions from the audience. There's a lot of now discussion. I, I, we don't have so many minutes left, but, but what I liked about Marianne's comment about this multidisciplinarity and about the psychology and the behavior and, and the farmer perspective, we do have one speaker, farmer, and we do have some in the audience. So would there be a willing farmer to comment on this? How do we get the farmers uh, with us in this work? Well, I, I think one, um, it's very interesting to hear that the government has also taken into account, account that mm. the psychology of, of these decisions is important. And in my opinion, I, I think that in many, in many different practices, uh, if we think about organic farming, to many farmers, uh, when you have a profession that you have maybe done for many, many years, 30 years or, or, or less, but you have a profession that you want to be able to, able to improve your skills as, as well. 
uh, taking on new practices and taking on new methods uh, that have an incentive behind them or that have multiple benefits uh, for your productivity, uh, it is also about sort of increasing the passion uh, towards your profession, increasing the skills uh, that you have in your profession, as you have in any other profession as well. You want to be challenged and, and find new skills uh, in, in that profession. And so I think it is extremely important uh, that we have Carbon Action Group and, and platforms such as these to bring together people to educate farmers and to sort of share the knowledge that they that we have together and and in that way sort of um, share the education and and the the know-how in 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 the field thank you if i may add to yes, this please. the eu commission has identified four obstacles for promoting uh carbon farming and uh, the first has been discussed here uh it's a financial uh financial uh burden and it relates to compensation uh, that, that we can receive from the, uh, the, the credits. The second relates to psychology, and it's a lack of trust. Mm -hmm. Lack of trust within the market, or within the buyers, and within the uh, suppliers, and, and the audience, which re re refers to that, that okay, we, this should be transparent, we need clear rules, we need everything as transparent as possible. And the third uh, obstacle is this monitoring, reporting, and verification, which there's lots of research going on on that. And and the fourth relates very much to Tanya's, uh, what Tanya said, and it's the advisory services mm -hmm. and the, the professional identity of, of farmers. And, and winning these is one of these four obstacles, is one, one big thing for all of us, and I think mm -hmm. that Today we have done some work on yes. this. In any case, that's true. Yeah. Can I comment uh, yes, Tanya, uh, a bit more uh, on the uh, before we talked about the overlapping incentives? And I think also we have to keep in mind that um, when you want to um, incentivize farmers to adopt these practices, it is also important to have uh, the overlapping in the sense that we need to have. Uh, the benefits always have to exceed the disadvantages uh, or the costs in farming. So if you think about uh, productivity is one benefit that you can achieve from carbon farming, that, but then you ha can have the cap support, uh, the incentive from that, or you can have the voluntary carbon market. So even though it is important to see the boundaries and set, set the sort of different um, uh, distances between the overlapping, it is also important to realize that sometimes uh, different incentives are needed uh, to f for form a whole uh, picture for the farmer as well. Thank you so much. I think we take. A, sorry, I think now we take a final comment from the audience because I was looking. We don't have many minutes left, so please. Hello, uh, my name is Juuso Jona. I'm a carbon farmer and educator, and also participating in this live project. And uh, I totally agree with all the participants here today, and like to add that the paradigm shift in agriculture, in, in many cases, is about the mindset shift. Mm. And uh, to adapt to carbon farming practices uh, are quite a long route for farmers. I mean, they many times they don't need high investments, but a mindset shift. And but farmer needs incentives and encouraging and, and knowledge. And we do have one elephant in the room also today, which is cap subsidies, which are mainly based on their direct subsidies, mm -hmm. area based, and they are passivizing farmers, at least me, uh, <laughs> to do anything else than to lift the sub subsidies. But uh, what I like from the example of the Nathai and Johan is that you have uh, this uh, result-based uh, uh, approach, which is also encouraged by by uh, EU Commission for this incoming uh, cap period, but it's neglected, at least in Finland. And that's what we should add, and we are also doing in Carbon Action, to try to measure and incentivize and motivate farmer uh, by this result-based approach. And that's what's needed. And and final uh, comment is that the knowledge is one of the limiting factors among farmers, mm -hmm. and that, that needs to be to work a lot to uh, educate uh, advisors and 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 to have enough resources. I mean, money, 
for advisory. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think now we have to end this webinar. Oh, I will give some take home messages, but we are running out of time. I think we could continue. Excellent comments. Thank you, Yusa. And we could continue. I'm sure you would all like the comments, but it could, could maybe to, uh, start paying for the results. I guess that was to conclude. But now, uh, I'm sorry to say that we have to be, we have to start ending this very lively discussion. And thank you so much for the audience online and for all the speakers and organizers and the audience here in, in the webinar studio for the very lively webinar. And um, so we have covered different dimensions of the carbon market and carbon farming. And I think that we really have made a valuable contribution also to the European discussion uh, to, as we are part of the EU Green Week. So this discussion will continue, but if I, you all had very uh, clear three main conclusions. So if I try to make sort of three, three take home messages myself at the end. So we all know cutting emissions is not enough to mitigate climate change. So we have, have we must find ways to increase the carbon sinks. And carbon farming does have high potential to this. And in agriculture, we need to make full use of the potential of the mineral soils to store carbon and also to adopt more climate friendly farming methods on organic soils. So take the potential into use. We really need, do need this carbon farming. But then carbon farming in agriculture, it has to be done in a way which also improves soil health and food productivity. And it's good for biodiversity and water quality. So we are we are aiming for multi multi benefits and then the third points farmers they require information more favorable uh, advice and economic support to adopt these more favorable practices in addition to these common agricultural policy subsidies we do need these market payments in different forms and, and this voluntary carbon credit scheme should be continued as they can be tailored to answer different expectations from both buyers and the, to credit the producers. So we do need to continue, continue this discussion all together. So thank you to all and please stay safe. We have to now end this very lively webinar. Thank you so much.